Just 10 days of campaigning to go until the general election when voters will decide who will represent them in Parliament and who will lead the country. So which of the party leaders has the best plan for the future? Tonight I'm joined by the leader of the Scottish National Party and the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. Nicola Sturgeon, the SNP has governed Scotland for 10 mm. years. So can we start by agreeing that the performance of Scottish public services is the responsibility of you and the SNP government? Uh, I take responsibility for the performance of our public services, although Scotland's overall budget, of course, is determined by decisions taken mm. at Westminster and our budget has been reduced over the years since the Conservatives have been in office. Let's start then with Alex Salmon's former head of policy, Alex Bell. This is what he's had to say. The evidence shows that we, the SNP, haven't closed the poverty gap, redistributed wealth, improved education or educated more poor people. The sad truth is that pretty much everything we have done to date hasn't worked. Uh, well, it won't surprise you to hear, Andrew, I don't agree with that assessment. Let me take education, for example, because it's something I have said is my top priority and it's something I have recognised we've got more work to do on. But it's not true to say that we haven't seen improvements in Scottish education. If you take the attainment gap, for example, and take level five qualifications, which are broadly equivalent to the old O grades and standard grades in Scotland, uh, we've seen more young people achieve those, but we've also seen the gap between the richest pupils and the poorest pupils almost half. We've also seen the number of the poorest pupils that leave school with no qualifications half as well. So there's real progress being made, but I make no bones about the fact I want to see us make more progress, which is why we've now got a major uh, programme of reform right. underway in Scottish education. I'm going to come on to education okay. and the details in a minute. But overall, this former head of policy for Mr Salmon, he calls it the lost decade. Look, he's a former head of policy. Um, I don't agree with that assessment. Quite a damning criticism well, look, I, I, from inside your own party. I, I I don't accept that the facts and figures bear out that assessment. You've said, well, come on to education, I'm happy to do so. If you take health, for example, uh, we've increased well, the health budget substantially. We've got the right. best performing accident. And I'm going to come on to health in a minute. So let me start with the, the Scottish UK. economy, because it's now growing at less than a quarter of the pace of the UK economy. It could be on the brink of recession. Don't you think that you should end your obsession with independence and start generating some growth in well, Scotland? Again, let me take the facts and figures on the economy. Yes, we've seen growth slow. The UK as a whole has seen growth slow. way behind in, the UK. Well, we, we've also had the, the issues, the problems with North Sea oil and gas, which has fed through the Scottish supply chain. But you know, if you look at the GDP performance in Scotland now, the recovery from the pre-recession level of GDP has actually been stronger than in the UK. Yeah. Unemployment is now lower than it is across the UK. We've seen productivity increase at a faster rate than the rest of the UK. So as on education, as on health, I'm not sitting here and saying there's not a big job of work for an SNP government to do. But your assessment that, you know, in everything you want to point to, uh, there is no progress is just flatly wrong. Well, it was Mr Bell that was that pointed well, to I, that, I, no, I've not already me. said I, I don't but, agree but with Mr Bell's let, assessment. Let, on the Scottish uh -huh. economy, last year the UK economy overall grew by almost mm -hmm. 2%. The Scottish economy grew by less than half a but percent. Not, That's a terrible but, record. But you know as, as well as I do that the difficulties that have been experienced in the oil and gas sector have a, a disproportionately heavy effect in Scotland because of the importance of that sector to the Scottish economy. So that has been one of the reasons why we've seen a difference in performance. But if I look at you know the recovery of GDP in Scotland uh, from the pre-recession level is 1.8% higher. It's less than that in the rest of the UK. You, and employment is uh, doing well. Unemployment is lower. We are outperforming the UK in you, youth you employment and female employment. Well, I am uh, working very hard with the Scottish Government to ensure that that's not the case. But we saw figures for the UK GDP 
uh, just at the, the end of the week that showed that there's also a slowing of growth because of the Brexit effect. And Scotland is not immune no, from the impact of the Brexit vote. But why would the Brexit effect have a bigger impact on well, Scotland I'm than the saying, rest of the United Kingdom? Well, it hasn't had an effect on British growth. If, if you listen to what I was saying, I wasn't saying the Brexit effect had had a bigger impact. I actually was saying that the reason for the different performance of the Scottish economy is the difficulties in the oil and gas so sector. So it's not Brexit? But... Uh, I think there is and will continue to be a Brexit effect in our economy. But if you listen to what I was saying, I was not saying that that was greater in Scotland than the rest of well, the UK. I was pointing you, to uh, the particular issues in the oil and gas your sector. Your finance minister, but, Mr Mackay, he blamed the economic reality of Brexit for the figures. Well, I, my, my view is there is an impact of Brexit. We're seeing in terms of the value uh, of sterling and the inflation effects in our economy. Uh, we are, but you know what? What you're asking UK me about? UK-wide, do you know? I don't understand why Brexit would have a disproportionately I, bad I, effect on but Scotland. I, I haven't argued. You're, you're but that's putting, what your finance minister did. Well, you're putting something to me that I haven't argued. Fifth of wasn't. April, 2017, Derek Mackay. The new economic figures, these sure. are the bad ones mm -hmm. I've given, reflected, quote, the economic reality of Brexit. But he wasn't saying that that was disproportionate in Scotland. But you've asked me about the performance of the Scottish economy, and I'm saying that whether it's on the recovery of GDP from the pre-recession, whether it's on unemployment, which in Scotland is lower than the UK average, whether it's on productivity, or I'll give you another uh, indicator, foreign direct investment into the Scottish economy. We had the latest EY report out last week showing for the fifth year in a row Scotland is the best performing part of the UK outside of London and the South East. When it comes to R&D investment, we are the best bar, uh, no part of the UK. We see one in 50 foreign investment projects in Europe now coming to Scotland. So there's much to be positive about in the Scottish economy, but much to do as well. Let's come on to education. You Indeed. mentioned it at the top <clears> of our, our interview. And it's been clear for some time that Scottish education has some real problems. Official surveys show declines in literacy and numeracy. Scottish schools are plummeting down global league tables. And why have you only just noticed? Were you well, too busy on the second referendum <laughs> to get stuck in to the schools? Well, again, as I started out doing, I can point you to a number of indicators that show improvements in Scottish education and a narrowing of the attainment gap. So the statistics I gave you earlier on on level five qualifications, not only are we seeing more young people achieving those qualifications, we're seeing the gap between the richest and the poorest narrow. We're seeing yeah, the numbers... That's partly because the top 20% are not doing so well. It's not because that, that, the bottom well, 20% are doing that, well. That's factually not true. Well, more, it is actually. The PISA uh, yeah. survey, the, the authoritative <laughs> global survey, showed that the highest achievers in Scotland were now in decline. They'd gone from 8.8% to just over 7%. Well, if, if you take tariff scores in Scottish education, which measure not just the quantity of qual qualifications that young people get, but the quality as well, it shows that performance in the top 20% has improved by about 9%, uh, but the performance in the bottom 20% has improved by 26%. We've also got more young people, including more of our poorest young people, going into university than has been the case before. Now, I say that simply to set the context. Well, I have been very frank about the fact that I want to see further improvement in Scottish education. So that's why we've got a new national improvement framework. It's why we've established an attainment fund. I was talking to a head teacher mm. who stopped me in the street yesterday to talk about uh, what he described as the life-changing impact of the new pupil mm. equity fund that we've introduced in Scottish education. So there's there's progress there to well, be positive not, about, uh, but there's much more work to do. There's not progress on what matters, which is reading, mathematics, well, I, 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 science. In... 2006, since 2006, on this PISA, the main international study, Scotland has dropped from 11th to 23rd in reading, 11th to 24th in maths, 10th to 19th in science. And That's I've, a terrible performance. Well, those statistics are from two years ago, and I've mm. recognised those. Uh, they predate the reform programme that we've put in place. But I do think it matters. You said we're not improving where it matters. I actually do think the qualifications that our young people are coming out of school with do matter. We're seeing more young people coming out with hires and advanced hires. We're seeing more young people going into university. We're seeing the positive destinations of young people continuing to increase. So I, I am not sitting... And remember, the, the record of the SNP Scottish Government it was assessed by the Scottish people at the Scottish Parliament election last year, and we won that election with a a higher share of the constituency vote than any party but in the entire lifetime of the Scottish on, Parliament. On top of this international study, your own official body on literacy and numeracy came out with some pretty damning figures about what was happening there. And if you can't get literacy and numeracy right, 
I'm not sure what you can get right in education. What your are you talking about? Your response, the Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy. It's not a, official... well, firstly, it's not an organisation. It's a survey that we carry out. Yes. Um, but and you've closed me, it down. But let, let me take... Let, you've let me, closed it down. It, because we've, it's a sample survey that is based on information in about 12 pupils per secondary school. What we are replacing it with is comprehensive data broken down not just by local authority but school by school. That that well, survey This survey was highly regarded in educational it, it doesn't, circles, it doesn't, wasn't as, it? As, as First Minister, it doesn't tell me anything about the performance of individual schools. So mm. uh, I'm replacing it with something that will give you, us not just sample data, but data on every pupil in every school the in the country. Which the teachers will provide. Uh, informed by standardised yes. assessments. But will you publish the standardised assessments for every we, school? We'll, we'll publish the for information... For each school, we'll publish the information on the percentage of pupils ah. that are meeting the required levels of the curriculum for excellence. So the SSLN, and I want to come back to a point in SSLN because it's important Which here. is the survey and literacy. Yes, but I want to come back numeracy. to that. T take the performance of young people at S2, which is where the decline in reading was recorded. Uh, that is measuring S2, secondary, the second year of secondary school pupils, against the standards they are supposed to meet at the end of the third year of secondary school. We have separate data that shows that by the time those S2 pupils come out of third year, more than 80% of them are meeting the required standards. Now, I'm not suggesting we shouldn't uh, pay a lot of attention to that survey, but what I'm showing right. is there's a lot of other data in Scottish education right. which sort of tells a different story Except from the one you're trying this, to tell me right here. This just survey now. provided a benchmark and the results were not kind to your policies. And you've closed it down. You won't do well, it Andrew, again. Was, you shot is, the messenger. Frankly, other global studies, other global studies have shown Scottish schools in relative decline. You pulled out of them too. You, you, you pulled out just, of two major well, studies. To, firstly, you've just sat and quoted an international global study to me, the PISA right. study, which Scottish education is is part but, of. But you pulled uh, out of two are, others that were global studies well, too. We we wanted to focus on making sure we got the information that gave us the best picture of how Scottish education was performing. But I have to say, it's an absolute travesty for you to sit here and say to me that in somehow moving from SSLN, if you look at the methodological uh, notes at the end of SSLN, it tells you that that survey is based on something like four pupils per primary school and 12 pupils per right. secondary school. What we are doing is replacing that sample survey that tells you nothing about local authority performance, it tells you nothing about individual school performance oh. with comprehensive right. data. Bro no, you don't want to hear this. No, no, I do want Broken to hear it. All I'm saying is that this was a highly regarded survey that you so are now closing I, down I am going and the to be results publishing. were not good. We are going to be publishing data on every school. I will be much more accountable as a result of the more comprehensive data we're publishing. The government will be more accountable, local authorities will be more accountable, uh, and we will absolutely be able to track the benefits and uh, the performance of schools okay. based on the interventions we're now making. Uh, the SNP's great boast is that students don't pay tuition mm -hmm. fees in Scotland, if you're Scottish. Uh, you claim it improves social mobility. So why is it twice as hard for a Scottish kid from a deprived background to get to university than an English well, kid from a deprived background. Firstly, we're seeing record numbers of Scottish young people going to university. That's true including, in England too. OK, but including record numbers of young people from the most deprived backgrounds. Still twice as hard. The second, well, the second point, which I'm, I'm sure is one that you're well aware of, is that the, the figures don't reflect what is a very important difference between how young people in Scotland and England access higher education. A much a larger proportion of young people in Scotland do higher education and further education colleges. So what you've just quoted me there but doesn't take account of But I'm talking about universities. Uh, sure, but, but higher education... So, I think the figure... No, well, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the figure you've probably quoted there is about access to higher education. No, the figure is from people going from school to university, uh, from poorer backgrounds, and it's almost sure. twice as tough in Scotland from a poorer background than from but, England. Uh, the, the point is a lot of people do higher education courses right. in further education colleges and then go to as university. well as in... You know, well, some of them do, some of them right. don't. but I'm talking but about is, university. Look, it, I think it is accepted there is a difference in how these figures are, are gathered. Not by much. I looked at this because you've said this before. By and large, the figures of wh when you leave school to go to university mm -hmm. are comparable for Scotland and England, and they show that it's twice as tough if you're a poor kid in Scotland. Well, we're seeing increases in the number of young people from the poorest backgrounds going to university. And we that's why we've established a widening access commission that is looking at how we make further progress. We're the only part of the UK, I think, still to date, that has legislated in terms of fair access to university. We've set 
targets for equal access by 2030. We are funding mm. protected places at university or, to or make Only it... one in 12 at our top universities in Scotland are from poor well, backgrounds. Again, you, you, you keep sort of changing the, the, the parameters of this. No, I just stuck to universities. You've, well, you said top universities there. That's not yeah. all universities. So you, well, one you in 12 changing. from the top then. Look, are, are, are young people from more deprived backgrounds underrepresented in our universities? Yes, but we are seeing that improve and we have in train a programme of work to improve it further. Why, why did you cut maintenance grants for poorer students? We have uh, got the best package of student support uh, of any of the UK nations. It's a combination of grants and loans. Mm. In England, of course, bursaries, grants, mm. are being abolished completely. And you cut the grants? Uh, we have, in the last uh, couple of years, we have increased the value of the grant proportion and we've increased the income threshold at which young people qualify for the maximum grant. But w what, we've, what we did was establish a minimum income guarantee for mm. students, which is, yes, a combination of grants mm. and loans. But we are protecting... Uh, the, the, the continuation of grants as part of that. In England, grants, bursaries grants have completely been abolished. Eh, because we, yes, we introduced and grants are what matter to working class kids. They need to be able to support well, themselves through university. That, which, which is why in Scotland we're not abolishing them like the case well, in England. No, you just also, cut them. Eh, but also in terms of student debt, we've got the lowest average student debt of any of the nations okay. of the UK. So, Andrew, the point I'm making to you here is I don't sit here and say that we are perfect. And I don't sit here and say that we don't have challenges to face and work to do to face them. But what I will defend is the progress we're making and also on things like student debt and student grants, that right. we are actually further advanced in many of these respects All than right. any other part of the UK. Let me move on to health. You, you're always railing against what you call Tory austerity. So why did your members of the Scottish Parliament vote against increasing nurses' pay? Well, I've set out a position. We, we have a as is the case across the UK, um, a 1% pay cap mm. across the public sector. And you voted to sustain well, can, that. Can I, can I just explain the, the position we're in and, and the action we've taken and what I think needs to happen in the future? Um, we have had that pay cap to try to protect jobs uh, and make sure that we could support a policy of no compulsory redundancies in our NHS. Again, uh, a policy that other parts of the UK don't have. Well, no nurses We've have also, been made redundant in England. There's 12,000 NHS staff being made yeah, uh, not redundant. Uh, there have been, re been redundancies across the NHS. Not nurses. Uh, I, I would have to double check that, but I think you might be wrong uh, on that point. Uh, but we've got a policy of no compulsory redundancies. We've also done two other things. Let me finish this point because it's important. We've done two other things that haven't been done in other parts of the UK. We've given bigger increases to those at the lowest end of the, the income scale. Um, and we've also protected what's called progression as people move through the pay scales. That hasn't happened in other parts of the UK. So if you're a newly qualified nurse in Scotland, you're actually paid more than you are in any other part of the, the United Kingdom. Now, that pay cap's been in place for reasons that I don't enjoy having mm. to And you to could accept. have changed it. Well, what I'm saying now is we've, we've, if, if we'd changed it, we would have seen pressure in other ways, in jobs, uh, for example. But we've sought to protect the lowest income People for that. So if you're a nurse, you're paid more in Scotland than you are in England. Well, not about England. that that much. If you're well, a registered staff nurse in Scotland, on a 12-hour shift, you'll end up with under £2 less on a 12-hour shift if, than an if, English if nurse. If you're, a, it's not huge. if you're a newly qualified nurse, it's about three to £400 mm. pounds a, a year better off. Nurse, if you're an nurse. agenda for change, not a nurse, if you're at the lowest mm. level of agenda for change, it's more than that. It's about £1,000. Now, you know, I'm making that point to say we've taken action where we can. But can I finish the point about the future? I've been very clear that as inflation starts to increase, because this pay cap's also been in place, it's not been easy for anybody mm. in the public sector, but it's been in place at times of reasonably mm. low and inflation. And you voted to sustain it for another Look, there year. was a simplistic motion. Well, actually, we're about to go into negotiations for uh, the mm. next financial year. And I've been very clear in our manifesto, which we'll publish uh, on Tuesday, we'll say more about this. At times of rising inflation, I don't believe pay caps of that nature will continue to be sustainable. So we'll set out how we will ensure in the future... So you'll change the pay cap in the future? Let me publish the manifesto on Tuesday, but I think, right. I, I think if you can listen to what I'm saying, you'll get a clear hint that we need to have paid deals in the future that are both affordable but recognise the cost of living pressures that public okay. sector workers uh, are working under. And we'll continue to do All what right. UK governments haven't do, done in terms of the NHS, is always accept the recommendations of the pay review body.
If you do well in this general election, will you use that to strengthen the case for a second independence referendum? Well, this election, I mean, we put in our manifesto for the Scottish election last year the uh, idea that Scotland should have a choice at the end of the Brexit. If there was a vote for Brexit, that Scotland should have a choice. So what this election does, I suppose, is, is determine whether the people of Scotland think that whether and when Scotland should have a choice about our future should be a decision for the Scottish Parliament or for uh, a so, UK So it will strengthen minister. the case if you do well. well. We've got that mandate already and it will underline uh, and reinforce that mandate. But this election will not decide whether or not Scotland becomes no, of course independent. Not. But you called for a second referendum because of Brexit. Mm -hmm. You said Scotland was being dragged out of the EU against its will. So can you confirm that an independent Scotland would immediately apply for full membership of the I'd EU? I'd want an independent Scotland to be a member of the EU. But would it apply for full membership? Uh, yes, we'd want to be a full member of the EU. You wouldn't settle for an interim deal? Look, or just being in the single can market? I, again, can I set this out? We tried uh, to find compromise ground with uh, the Prime Minister, whereby we would accept we were coming out of the EU, but see if we could keep mm. the whole of the UK, and if not that, then Scotland in the single market. But let me, you're talking here in the context of independence. Mm. So let me set out clearly, I, want, I would want Scotland to be a member of the EU. If, and it's an if because I don't uh, control the Brexit process and I can't foresee exactly sure. how that will unfold. If Scotland had already been taken out of the EU and there was a period uh, in which we had to uh, get back into the EU, if it was necessary, then we would want to protect our single market membership in the interim. So there could but be an interim arrangement? Well, if that was necessary, but the objective would be, and we've, we've heard people from, you know, voices within the Commission, the Deputy Chancellor of Germany, senior European parliamentarians talk about the fact that it would not be a complicated process for Scotland to uh, become a member of the, the EU if we were independent. But <clears throat> that's if we're independent. I think in this election, because I want Scotland to have a choice, not now, but at the end of the Brexit process when the options are right. clear. This election, though, gives Scotland uh, another opportunity. It gives us the opportunity to have our voice heard, generally in the House of Commons, but specifically in terms of the Brexit right. negotiations, so the, that we can try to make sure that there's not a deal that is bad for Scotland. The Prime Minister says that there won't be a second referendum on your timetable. If she wins and sticks to that, what will you do? Well, look, let's give the people of Scotland the chance to have their say in this election uh, on June the 8th. My, and, and this has been a long... I mean, you've covered Scottish politics for a long time. I, I was going to say probably longer than I've been alive, but that would upset you midway through a, an interview, which would probably not, not really. be a Not really. I'd just like you to answer the question. Idea. What will you do if the Prime Minister does not grant you well, a referendum? Look, I think if, if the SNP win the election on June the 8th in Scotland, and I'm taking nothing for granted, but if the SNP win the election having won the Scottish election last year on the strength of uh, a manifesto commitment that was very clear and in the interim the Scottish Parliament having uh, backed that, then I think that position of the Prime Minister is unsustainable. But if she doesn't I'm not change, going to, what look, would you do? I, I'm not going to sit here. We've got an election in 10 days' time. I'm not going to sit here and speculate about that. Let I mean, there's the not people, much... You, the truth let, is there's let, not much well, you can do, I is think there? in politics, you know, positions quickly become unsustainable and we've seen in the last few days and you highlighted this in your interview with her, that this is not a Prime Minister uh, who's very good at holding position when she feels it's under pressure. She's a Prime Minister that has right. seemed to perfect the art of the U-turn. Let me come on to Brexit. You say that a vote for the SNP will strengthen your hand in the Brexit talks. You're not in the Brexit talks. Well, you know what? We should be. Um, but you're and, not. And so should Wales and so should Northern Ireland. But you're not. But, well, but again, we've got an elect... You know, the, the Prime Minister has brought about this election... That gives the people of Scotland the opportunity, and I'm saying to people in Scotland, whether you voted Leave or Remain, whether you voted Yes or No in 2014, this is an opportunity to strengthen Scotland's voice in these Brexit talks and strengthen the influence we have in terms of the positions but, the UK government but, but takes. But Mrs May doesn't want you in the talks, and Mr Barnier, the lead EU negotiator, doesn't want you in the talks. I think in terms of the, the Prime Minister's position, you know, I, Ruth Davidson... So, uh, said the Scottish Tory leader said uh, not that long ago that she thought Scotland and the Scottish Government and me as First Minister should be involved in deciding and shaping the UK position. So if people, mm. if, if the SNP wins this election, it strengthens our hand. All right. Because the danger Scotland faces right now, the danger, in my view, that the whole UK faces, is not just Brexit, but it is the extreme Brexit that is being pursued by the Tories, that threaten tens of thousands of jobs in Scotland. So on this, as on so many other things, if you want Scotland's voice to be heard, if you want Scotland's interest to be the f to the fore, rather than just Tory MPs who rubber stamp whatever Theresa May wants, the only way to secure that is to vote SNP. You, you complain that powers being sent back to London from Brussels might not be passed on to Edinburgh. But under your plan, 
any return of powers to Edinburgh, you'll then send back to Brussels. Well, we, it's a nonsensical look, it, grievance. Well, look, these, are, these are issues that people of Scotland would scrutinise and debate if we are in another mm. independence referendum. I right. believe Scotland is an independent member state of the EU would have a much greater voice than we've had uh, as uh, a part of the, the UK over the years. But, you know, Theresa May is the one who wants to pursue Brexit and wants to pursue a hard Brexit. Now, if that's what she's doing, then to use that as a, a, a process to centralise power in the UK or in, in areas that are under the, the Scotland Act devolved to the Scottish Parliament, I do think would be unacceptable. But you would then send them back? Well, we would, if we were in the EU, we would continue to cooperate on these things well, as an independent that member would be state. The membership of but, the EU. but we would be representing Scottish interests as, as the member right. state. But let's be in no doubt here what we have as a Prime Minister that seems to want to centralise mm. powers, not just from Scotland, but from Wales and Northern Ireland as well. And I think it would be unacceptable to use Brexit to do that. You would rather see Jeremy Corbyn than Theresa May as Prime um, Minister? I don't want a Tory Prime Minister. I don't want to see um, a, a Tory government. I, I, so you'd I rather think... see Mr Corbyn? Look, I, I, I don't particularly like the looking at the state of UK politics just now and forming the conclusions I do. I don't think Jeremy Corbyn is, is credible as an alternative uh, Prime Minister. Um, but it's got to be one or the other, and I think you would rather see well, Mr I'd, Corbyn. I'd actually rather see, ultimately, Scotland be independent. Of course, and in but the that's interim, not the choice, as wh you've said. Whoever emerges, and you know, I think even with the narrowing of the polls, I, I still think it is highly likely that the Tories are going to win this election. So what matters for Scotland is that we've got the strongest possible voice. We know the damage okay. Tory governments do to but Scotland. If, if you found the, your SNP contingent in Westminster yeah. in a pivotal position, because maybe Mr mm -hmm. Corbyn has won, but perhaps not by much, or, not, <coughs> or only as the largest party, would the SNP work with Mr Corbyn to raise taxes to pay for more spending? Well, we've got our own tax policies mm -hmm. and we've put them forward already in terms of the taxes we control in Scotland and we'll see right. more but about UK that. UK-wide, would you, I, I, would you I, I work with I, Mr Corbyn to raise taxes? Uh, I don't agree with all of Jeremy Corbyn's tax policies. Look, we're, we're kind of getting into the realms of, and I understand why, so uh, bear sure. with me. Well, the this might be the result. Here. Look, I, I don't think it will be. And yeah, I don't but think if it is, will well, you work with Mr Corbyn my, on his tax and we, spend? We'll, we'll work for progressive policies hmm. and we'll work for the uh, policies we put forward in our manifesto. If there was to be a hung parliament, uh, of course, we would look to be part of a progressive alliance that pursued progressive policies. But let's get back to the reality of this election. The reality of this election, even with a narrowing of the polls, is that we're going to face a Tory government, perhaps with a bigger majority. So my priority in this election is to say to people in Scotland, if you want Scotland's interest to be protected and our voice heard, then you've got to vote SNP to make sure that's the case. Uh, voting Tory delivers Tory MPs who rubber stamp right. Theresa May. And voting Labour in Scotland risks letting the Just Tories in. Just one final thing on, on, on Mr Corbyn. He wants to raise corporation tax by a third. Would you broadly agree with that? No. Um, I, don't, I don't agree right now with uh, the proposition that we should reduce the headline rate of corporation tax, mm. but I don't agree with that either. What I would like to see, and again, my manifesto mm. will say more about this on, on Tuesday, I think we should be targeting support for businesses. Given okay. the productivity challenge we've got, I think we should be targeting support to All encourage right. businesses to invest in plant and machinery I understand. and I also just, to take on workers. Final 30 seconds. I just want to ask you this. Mr Salmon says the Labour manifesto is actually an imitation of the SNP programme in, some respects in it government. Is. Are you proud uh, of that? But free, well, I think it shows Scotland's leading the way in progressive policies. Free so tuition, Scotland is the first Cor Corbynista government. Scotland is leading the way in progressive policies across the UK. And, and to answer your question directly, yes, I'm very proud of that. So you're proud of being a, a forerunner for Mr Corbyn. I, I, I'm, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, <laughs> as you know. It is indeed. <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon, uh, thank you for being with us tonight mm -hmm. on this interview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.